Uh, it's an honor to be here with you. If you're the type likes follow following actual Bible, Jonah chapter 4. Uh, we're going to get there in, in just a second. It's good to be here with my Springfield family. And, um, and thank you for such a gracious introduction, Deb. As Deb said, afterwards we do have our table set up out there. 100% of what we make from that, we give to the poor and the afflicted. Uh, we have uh, three orphanages in China that look after children with mental disabilities. Two in Hinyang, one in Changsha. We also have a rescue home in Cape Town that gets girls out of the sex industry, off drugs, high school educated, and job trained. So we can do our part to break the cycle of poverty in the Cape Flats. It's been about three years since I've been here. So I think almost everything on the table would be new. Since the last time I was here. So not everything, but almost everything. So you could come pick up. There's a, there's a brand new series on the book of Revelation out there. Um, I, I got so embarrassed by the stuff I was seeing Christians put on the internet about Revelation. I just couldn't cope. I Frankly, I was like, oh my goodness. Um, and so I had three options. I could, I could criticize them in public. That's not a good option. I could judge them. That's not a good option. Or I could just teach through it and... Yeah, anyway, so you can pick that up. Also have a new Christology course out there you could pick up. Um, and with the help of Dustin Bell, um, I just uh, finished a 13-part series on sex. So, um, which, uh, this is going to sound like I'm making a joke. My, I'm not. My master's degree is actually in sex. So, like, in... So in theory, like I'm the best, right? Right. But uh, now, now in, in, in practice, pretty much crap. But in theory, like no one's better than. Me. Um, and so I got asked. I got asked by so many people, please address issues of sexuality. And so I did it as uh, 13, 15 minute table talks that is designed to for you and your friends afterwards to talk through those issues because for just somebody barking, telling people what to believe, that's not helpful. Um, to, to teaching people how that belief creates certain things. Uh, that's a better way to do it. So anyway, that's out there, um, and you can pick that up. You, 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 the thing is, you can't pick it up today because the videos are still being mastered. Um, but if you give Robin your email, as soon as we get it, we'll just send it to you as a link. All right, so I want to talk to you today about the Bible, right? So I get over the Bible. I'll take that very seriously. And anytime you do that, you want to ask at least two questions. One, what happened? And two, more importantly... What's happening in me right now because of what happened? And so I want to specifically address um, the kind of church Springfield Christian family is intentional about becoming, all right? And that's going to be a two-part sermon. The first part will be this service. The next part will be the next service. And really, there's going to be lots in it. But really, if you're going to pay attention all day, it will be a two-part sermon. And so because great churches are made up with great people, and this is called Springfield Christian Family, I think one of the things we need to do is reclaim the beauty of the word Christian, right? Because Christian has lost its beauty. And it's the Christian's fault, by the way. It's not the world attacking the Christians. It's Christians presenting themselves as things we're not, right? Christians are not political experts. They're not. Christians are not climate science experts, unless you happen to be a climate science expert and a Christian. They're not. Christians are not medical experts. They're not. Christians are supposed to be experts in how to see the world how Jesus saw the world, how to see God how Jesus saw God, and how to apply Scripture how Jesus applied Scripture, which means we see the world a certain way. Christians are not experts in who goes to heaven and who doesn't. That's not what we're about. We're not even about going to heaven when we die, although we embrace that part of the story. But Christianity is all about seeing the world how Jesus saw the world, seeing God how Jesus saw God, and applying Scripture how Jesus applied Scripture. And if we do that, we can actually recapture the beauty of the word Christians. Instead, if, if, you, if somebody said, are you a Christian, and they have all these pictures about what that means, words don't matter. How people picture words functioning matters. And so we need to create a better picture. And one of the things we're going to have to decide to do, I think, is illustrated really well in the book of Jonah and in the life of Jesus. So we're going to explore that. Anytime you open the Bible, you want to ask what happened, which I'm going to do my best at explaining. And then what's happening in me right now because of it, right? So I'm going to read from the end of the book, and that's inappropriate, right? Because you might not know what happened up to that point. So if you're here today and you did your master's thesis on the book of Jonah, bear with me. If you're here today and you're like, I'm vaguely familiar with that. There's something about a fish, something, right? If that's you, um, you we're, I'm going to sort of catch everybody up with the story. So here is the entire book of Jonah in four minutes. You're going to have to pay pretty close attention, okay? So there's this guy named Jonah. He's the son of Amittai. He was called by God to preach to Nineveh. Now let's just stop and talk about that. Nineveh was a real place at a real time. Um, it was the capital city of the Assyrian Empire. These people were ruling almost the entire known world, and they were megalomaniacs. They were crazy folks. Folks. They were barbarians. Whatever your problem is with the Australian government today, it is Nickelodeon compared 
to the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrian, and the Assyrian Empire wasn't like ruling one little place. It was ruling the entire known world. Um, it, we're more familiar with the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire is the empire Jesus lived in. And if you cross the Roman Empire, here's what they did to you. They beat you to death, and then they nailed you to a cross and let you finish dying by suffocation. That was called crucifixion. I, and I've heard people say that's the worst way ever to create it to die. Maybe. It's definitely in the discussion. But the Assyrians were pretty bad, too. This was before the Roman Empire. They did not crucify people. The Romans invented crucifixion. The Assyrians filleted you. So if you cross them, they tied you up in public and they peeled your skin off. As a matter of fact, Tiglath-Pileser had mastered the art of how to peel people's skins off and then leave them alive. As an example, this is what happens if you mess with us. As a matter of fact, there's this one time there was this farming community that started a revolt against Assyria, supposedly. He took a platoon of army people in there and he tied the guy down and he peeled his face off. Put his eyes out, cut his nose off, chopped his ears off and left him as an alive person. This is what happens if you mess with us. Uh, by the way, I, I have a picture of this. I don't want to gross you out, but I want to I have some impact here. If you could put that picture up. This is, a, this, is the, this is a picture of a judge who got caught robbing from Tiglath-Pileser. And, um, and as you can see, they tied him down in public. You have people witnessing this. You have people dressed. And you can see they start at the ankles, and they've, um, and they've already started peeling his face off up there. And they start at the ankles, and they peel your skin off. This was Friday night entertainment. So um, it just take a second, and I want you to just... I want you to capture that just for a second. We, I, I had an Australian with a straight face tell me the other day that the government of Australia today is as corrupt as any government ever. And I just, I just, uh, whatever your problem is with ScoMo, it ain't that, all right? So, so you could take that down now because I don't want to make people sick. But that, that, was, that, that was the Assyrian Empire. If you, if you cross them, they tied you down and peeled your skin off. So... God calls Jonah to preach there, and Jonah's pretty reasonable. He's like, no, I'm not going there. I'm partial. Like, did you see that? Like, no, I'm not, I'm not doing that. So Jonah goes to Joppa, boards a ship to Tarshish. He gets on a random ship, and this is where the, the story gets pretty confronting. Um, the the uh, pagan sailors on this random ship actually have a higher view of human life than God's prophet. A uh, storm comes up. God's prophet's like, just throw me overboard. They're not, We're not going to throw you overboard, bro. He's like, why? They said, because you're a human, man. And we care about human life more than our personal freedoms and profits. That was sort of a confronting thing because we find out in this story that it's possible um, for pagan people to actually have a higher view of human life than God's prophet. Just because you're God's prophet doesn't mean you see things God's way. Anyway, so, uh, so he ends up getting thrown overboard and, um, and, a, and, and he's going to drown. Absolutely going to drown, except for the fact there's this fish. So this fish shows up and saves him from drowning. This was God's salvation. When I was seven, my Sunday school teacher told me, you better do what God says or you're going to get swallowed, right? Because the fish was God's judgment. The fish was not God's judgment. The fish was God's salvation, right? Because if you're going to drown and there just happens to be a fish to save your sorry behind from drowning, even though you're doing the exact opposite thing as what you're supposed to do, that's called God's salvation. He's in the fish for three days. Three days later, God tells the fish to throw up. Again, that's a salvific sort of experience, like you don't want to be there very long. He throws up, which is a disaster because now he's going to drown, except for the fact that the fish throws up near dry land. Bonus. And it just so happens <laughs> that the dry land that he throws up on is next to a road, and that road goes to, you guessed it, Nineveh. So there's this whole thing going on. And so, so Jonah goes and he preaches to Nineveh. And he preaches the worst sermon you've ever heard in your life. It's only five words long in Hebrew. It's eight words long in English. He just This is his whole sermon. Forty days from now, you're going to be destroyed. See you later. No why, no how, no what do we do about it. No, nope, just God is going to destroy you. The, the problem is, is that it works and everybody repents. It says, from the greatest to the least, even the animals fasted, right? Which is a whole big thing, right? And so so it says everybody repents. And then there's this really weird line in there. In English it says, so God repented of the calamity he had planned. Um, but in Hebrew, it just simply says God repented of evil, which leads to all kinds of questions. But the point of it is, is this, this beautiful picture of God, of divine mirroring, of if you're willing to go through the pain of repentance, if you're looking around for where God is when you're repenting, he's on his knees next to you, repenting with you. The reason we recoil from the word repentance is not because of what repentance means. 
means. It's because of the pictures that's been created. Normally, a charismatic preacher telling you to get up here and repent so God will be nice to you. In that picture, God is above you demanding action so he'll be kind. Actually, in the scripture, it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. So if you're ever willing to go through the pain of repentance and you're wondering where God is, evidently he's the one kneeling next to you, repenting with you. Like, if you're willing to go through this, I'm doing it right there with you. And so there's this whole thing. And so God ends up being nice to the Ninevites. Well, this ticks Jonah off. And he tells God all about himself. And it goes something like this. I knew it. I knew you were a compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and forgiveness, God. I knew you were a God who repented from evil. So what we find is, is that Jonah was not scared of being filleted. Jonah was scared that it would work. Jonah, in Jonah's mind, let's get, be fair to Jonah, in Jonah's mind, Assyrians were evil. Can get, we give him some kudos there? Like, people who skin people alive, it's in us to just automatically deem them as the other evil people. What Jonah finds is that God doesn't deem people evil. He deems actions evil. And what he finds is, is that God is not nearly as interested in destroying evil people as Jonah is. And God is not nearly as interested in destroying you as your enemies are. God just loves people just because they're people. And this is a very confronting thing for Jonah. Now, if you're a linear learner, you're already sort of lost. You're like, where's this going? Please start giving me some points, all right? So if you're a linear learner, I did this for you. Check this out. Next slide. So what we learn is that when we run from God, we run to the strangest places. That when we run from what God wants us to do, we never end up where we think. Like, think about everybody in this room would have some story of non-consent to God's wisdom. And it just didn't work out. It's not that God's mad at you. It just didn't work out like you thought, right? And, and we all have that kind of story. I love the first century church's definition of the wrath of God. The early church definition of the wrath of God is that the wrath of God is being handed over to the self-inflicted consequences of non-consent to consent, which I think is just brilliant. In other words, God is never actively angry at someone punishing them. The punishment is built into the non-consent. And so Jonah runs from God, and he ends up in weird places, like on boats with pagan sailors who love people more than prophet, and, and in, a, in the Mediterranean Sea, and in a fish, and he just, he ends up in strange places. What we also learn is that God is generous with his grace, that God is always out in front of Jonah, essentially reconsenting in love, saying, hey, hey, if you had enough, if you, you know, if you had enough of yourself. What we also learn, number three, next slide, is that God wants to get us back without paying us back. I love the, the early church fathers, Gregory of Nyssa and Athanasius, they said that the entirety of Scripture can be read in the prodigal son story. That you pick any passage in the Bible, pick anything from Judges, Isaiah, Kings, anywhere. And somewhere in that story is a pattern of someone who had peace with the Father only to non-consent to the Father's love and be handed over to the self-inflicted consequences of that non-consent and ending up in a pig pen, only to then find out that we're sick of the self-inflicted consequences and come back to the Father only to find that the Father always wants to get us back without ever making us pay him back. That there's no punitive sort of nature in God. What we also find in this story is that great moves of God start with a genuine revelation of the love of God for us and people we deem evil and people with different ideas and people of the other political party and people who don't look like us or think like us. That the moves of God start with a revelation of love of God for us, but then others. Oh, really, the whole point of Jonah is I've done everything to save you, even though you've done nothing right. Now, all I want you to do is be motivated by that to be kind to people who aren't doing anything right either. And Jonah doesn't get it. At the end of the story, the Bible is full of characters who are meant to be emulated. The Bible is also full of characters that are in the Bible to teach us what not to be. And Jonah is option B. This is the end of the story, and he never gets it. Jonah tells God off. I knew it. I knew you were a compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and forgiveness, God, a God who repents from evil. And so God doesn't strike Jonah dead. God again reconsents with an object lesson. It's a weird story about a plant. This is how it goes. Next slide. So Jonah went out and sat down at a place east of the city, and there he made himself a shelter and sat in its shade and waited to see what would happen to the city. In other words, I can't wait for God to destroy these people. 
Then the Lord God provided a vine and made it grow up over Jonah to give him shade for his head, ease his discomfort. Jonah was very happy about this, right? So if you're a note taker, this is the only time Jonah is called happy, which is strange. Um, but, but at dawn the next day, God provided a worm, and he chewed the vine and withered up. And then the sun rose. God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed in Jonah's head, and he grew faint, and he wanted to die. And he said, it'd be better for me to die than to live. So Jonah is now, Jonah, do you have suicidal thoughts? He's not exactly a stable sort of person. But God said to Jonah, do you have a right to be angry about the vine? A rhetorical question, right? You had nothing to do with it, right? Why are you angry about something that wasn't here 48 hours ago? Like, are you serious? Like, what, do you have any right to be angry about the vine? Jonah is not picking up what God is putting down. Jonah says, I do. I'm angry enough to die. <laughs> Right? God, watch, watch what this next slide. But the Lord said, well, you've been concerned about this vine, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 100, 120,000 people who cannot tell their right from their left, and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? That's the end of the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah ends with a question, frankly, a terrible way to end a book. I mean, if you want to be honest about it, unless the book is meant to be a sermon. Sermons are not meant to be conclusion makers. Sermons are meant to make us wrestle for apple. It, Jonah, essentially, essentially, God says to Jonah, if you were 10% as concerned with people as your plant, the world would be a better place. Are you serious? Someone's got to care about the people while you're spending all your energy caring about the plant. Should I not be concerned about them? And notice in the story, he doesn't even bring up anything they do. They're just people. Should I not be concerned with them because of that? Now, if you're a linear learner, I did this for you. Next slide. So here are some linear thoughts. We learned that we can run from God, but we can't outrun him. That God is always out in front of us, reconsenting in love and consent and wisdom. The early church father said that God eternally consents in love and consent and wisdom and, and actually just humbly waits for our mutual consent, that God's relationships are consensual, not coercive. We also learned that God wants to get us back without paying us back. I wanted to put that in twice because it's really important. But this is where I want to park for the rest of the morning, and that is this, that we learned that we can surrender to God's moral will for our lives and still miss God's redemptive plan for the whole world, that it's possible to be fully consented and surrendered to God's moral will for my personal life and still miss the entire point of God's love for people not like me. And that is frankly confronting because I'm in a room of people that I'm making an assumption. Because this is the early service, I'm guessing that you're fully devoted followers of Jesus, right? <laughs> right? It's flipping 830 when you came to church. That means you got up at, I don't know, 630. Listen, whatever it is, you're fully devoted followers of Jesus, and I want to commend that. I, I, I honor that, but here's why this is confronting. What we learn in this story is it's fully possible to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus and still miss the point about how Jesus sees the world, how Jesus sees God, and how Jesus applies scripture. This is when, have you ever seen a Christian on the internet beating the drum about personal freedom with no regard for others? As if that's how Jesus sees the world. Yes, freedom in Christ, but freedom in Christ is best expressed and experienced when it's submitted to the higher ethic of love. That's how Jesus saw the world. How do we know that? Read all four Gospels. That's the main thing. And just look at the cross. Every temptation of Jesus on the cross was use your personal freedom to violate love. And he would not do it. Even under great stress, he would not do it. We, we also learn this in Jesus' life. There's this incredible story in Mark chapter 10, about Jesus, his followers, and a blind dude. Now, I want to be clear about this before I read it. There's only certain people in this story. There's no Roman pagans. There's Jesus, followers of Jesus, and a blind dude. Now, let's think about that. If there's only Jesus, followers of Jesus, that's called the church or Christians, and then the tension in the story is, how do the Christians treat the most vulnerable? And it's actually really sad what happens. Next slide. This is Mark chapter 10, verse 46. Then they came to Jericho, and Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city. Jesus and people following Jesus. And a blind man named Bartimaeus, that's the son of Timaeus, was sitting beside the roadside. And he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, and he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy. Before we go forward, I want to point out something. This man's blind, and he's begging. But 
And for us, if I said a man was born blind, our response would be, oh, that's sad. But it was, and it is. But it was bigger than that in the first century. If you were born blind, there was a physical reality, your blindness. But then there was a social reality. The Roman Empire was a nine-layered class system. And you would be in class nine, right? So you were considered the anti-human, the unhuman. And then there was a religious sort of undertone that the religious establishment assumed if you were born blind that somebody somewhere had done something in your family and God was finally getting his pound of flesh on this poor dude, right? Remember, even later in the story, the disciples asked Jesus, who sinned that that guy was born blind? And Jesus like, what year is it? Are we still thinking like that, right? Like some people are born blind because of genetics, and, right? So, so the, the issue in this story is not just a blind dude. It's a social outcast. And the religious establishment would have justified treating him poorly because we're just helping God get his pound of flesh from this guy, right? And so there's all this stuff going on. But the main thing that's going on is how are followers of Christ using their power in how they treat the most vulnerable in society? And it's frankly shocking. Let me show you what happened. So this guy's screaming, have mercy on me. Watch the response of the followers of Jesus. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. So the followers of Jesus' response to the most vulnerable person asking for help was, Shut up! What's wrong with you? Can't you see we're following Jesus here? So the followers of Jesus were ignoring the most vulnerable in their own pursuit of Jesus? They failed to see. I wonder if that's relevant at all today. Do you know anybody who's claiming their freedom in Christ justifies their behavior to overlook the most vulnerable. Somebody asked me last week, I was tired. I'd done 23 sessions in a week. And they said, I know you're tired, but I'm going to walk you to your car and ask you something anyway. And I thought, thank you. <laughs> you're such a selfless person, <laughs> considering others better than yourself. And he said, what is your official position on Christianity and vaccines? And I said, sir, congratulations. You've done it. He said, I've done it. I said, you have? You've officially asked me the stupidest question I've heard all week. <laughs> and that's saying something. I said, man, that is about the most boring question I've ever heard. He said, do you find that boring? I said, yes, because it's a medical question framed in a theological framework. That's not a theological question. There are two specialists right over there. One's a specialist in virology. We should probably go talk to them. They're doctors. They're experts in this stuff. Actually, the theological question is not whether you get vaxxed or not. The theological question is, is how am I using my power? How am I using my resources and my power and my decision making? Are my behaviors upholding the most vulnerable and making them less vulnerable? Or are my behaviors making them more? Are, are they upholding them and making them less vulnerable? Or are they making the most vulnerable in a more vulnerable spot? And he said, huh, I hadn't thought about it that way. I said, that's okay. I'm actually not mad at you. If you're not thinking about it that way, that's I'm only asking are you using, I don't care if you're vexed or not. That doesn't make any difference to me. What makes a difference to me is how you're thinking about it. Like, are we using our power to uphold the most vulnerable or to make them more vulnerable? See, the way Jesus saw the world was to lift the lowly to the level of the elite, to end the class systems, to make sure that we're using our power and our resources to make the poor less poor, to make the more vulnerable less vulnerable. This is a basic way that Jesus saw, hey, considering others better than ourselves, is pretty basic. Now, what's happening in this story is the followers of Jesus are fully surrendered to Jesus, but they haven't connected surrendering to Jesus with how you see the world. And so they're willing to rebuke the beggar in their own pursuit of Jesus, which is just unbelievable. Now, I want to be fair to the disciples. Watch what happens. And he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, "Call." like Jesus has to remind them, I'm actually all about that guy. Right? And I want to be fair to the disciples and the people following Jesus. As soon as they realize Jesus loved that guy, they're like, really? Oh, blind man, it's your lucky day. He actually wants to speak to you. This actually goes well in the end. And so they repented very quickly. And to be fair, there's a lot of people who just don't realize how Jesus feels about the most vulnerable. And maybe you haven't thought about that. And that's okay. I want, I want to give you full freedom not to have thought about it until now. 
And, and I want you to think about not, I think we get cornered into petty, stupid questions because we're failing to answer the more profound question, which is, how am I using my power? You know, one day COVID will not be a thing. It just won't be a thing. But how you think about your power will be, that will outlast COVID. And to build a great church, we have to build people who see the word of Jesus all the world, which requires us to examine how we think about power. Now, if you're a linear learner, I did this for you. Next slide. Uh, are we overlooking the beggar in our own pursuit of Jesus? Are we overlooking the most vulnerable in our own pursuit of our faith? And, and thereby making our faith less beautiful because it's not how Jesus saw the world. Or let's say it this way. Are we pursuing God's will for us, amen, while ignoring his will for the rest for them? Like, are we pursuing God's will for us? What we find in Jonah and in Jesus is that fully devoted followers of Jesus or God, in God in Jonah's case, Jesus in Mark's case, um, is, is that, that it's possible to, to have this idea that I'm fully surrendered to God while ignoring people. Like, like maybe pursuing Jesus and loving our world is the same thing. Hey, 10 seconds for the Bible nerds, okay? Like if you're a Bible nerd, so am I. So just, if you're not a Bible nerd, don't tune out. It's 10 seconds, right? But if you're a Bible nerd, this is for you, right? Like I can read Greek. I know, I know, <laughs> right? I, 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 can, I can, my minor in seminary was New Testament Greek. If you hand me a Greek New Testament, I can read the Bible in its original language. I know. If you ever wondered, why doesn't he have a whole lot of luck with the ladies? That's why I read Greek. So... <laughs> In, in Greek, there's something called first attributive position. And first attributive position is when the conjunction and is used, if it's in first attributive position, then the first condition and the second condition are the same, right? So Jesus said the fulfillment of all scripture is to love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. In the Greek, that's in first attributive position. You can't tell in English, but in Greek, it's obvious it's in first attributive position. So to Jesus, how he saw the world is that loving God and loving people are the exact same thing. In other words, you can't, you can't differentiate your love for God from how you treat the most vulnerable, the poor, the people who can't pay you back, that, that it's, it's the same. There's this great book, this is an aside, but there's this, there's this incredible book that everybody should read. It should be a bestseller about this. The book is called First John. And First John is John spending five chapters essentially saying, if you say you love God, but there's a need and you know it's within your power to meet that need and then you don't meet the need, how can God be in that, right? That's the entire book of 1 John in one sentence, that you can't be humble before God and harsh with people. You can't do that. That you can't, that you can't say you love God and then disconnect that from how you're treating others, which leads me back to Jonah. Three questions about Jonah. Next slide. How does the book of Jonah end? What is the first and only description of Jonah being happy? And three, what is Jonah doing when he's described as happy? Well, the book of Jonah ends with a weird object lesson about this plant. It ends with Jonah wanting God to destroy people he doesn't like. And he ends up making a temporary shelter to give him comfort. The only time Jonah is described as happy is when he's sitting in his own comfort, hoping God destroys people he disagrees with. Do you know anybody like that? The only time they seem happy is when they're sitting in an air-conditioned home on the internet criticizing others and hoping God destroys them. Hmm. The only time, think about this. How many times in the book of Jonah does Jonah have the opportunity to be happy? I would say a lot. Okay, all right, look, follow me here. And God called Jonah to do something awesome and he was happy about it. No. And Jonah disobeyed God and lived to tell about it. He was happy that God was gracious to him. No. And Jonah got on a random boat with pagan sailors who happened to be nice guys. Uh-uh. And those pagan sailors cared about human life more than their personal profit. And he was so happy to be with really nice people. Nope. And he ends up being thrown into the Mediterranean Sea anyway. And he, instead of drowning, there was a fish that saved him from drowning. And he was so happy to see the fish. Uh-uh. And God tells the fish to throw up so that he's not stuck in there. And that was so happy that the fish throw up. I was so happy about that. Nope. And instead of throwing up in the middle of the sea, he threw up near dry land. It was a short walk so I didn't drown anyway. I was so happy to see dry land again. Uh-uh. And that dry land was next to a road that happened to go to Nineveh, which is where I was supposed to go anyway. I was so happy to see that road. Nope. And I go to Nineveh and preach the worst sermon ever, and they don't fillet me. I was so happy to keep my skin. <laughs> no, no, I'm not happy about that. I I'm sitting in shade underneath a plant I had nothing to do with, hoping God destroys people. Now this is living.
We wonder why depression and anxiety rates are at an all-time high in the church. Maybe it's because we're sitting underneath our plants, hoping God destroys people we disagree with. This is God in Jonah's world. God became a projection of Jonah's preference, and that, and, and that's our problem as well. For most of us, God, Jesus, Bible, whatever, just really is a projection of what we like. This is why Jesus in Alabama is a Republican with an automatic weapon. Jesus in Birmingham, Alabama is a Republican with an automatic weapon. Jesus in Birmingham, um, England is not. Jesus in Birmingham, Victoria, definitely not. Christians in Melbourne don't want automatic weapons in the church. But Christians in Alabama do. And they're all talking about the same Jesus. See, in that sense, Jesus becomes a projection of our preference instead of a projectile that cuts through all things. Jonah actually thought God thought about the world how he did. <laughs> they're evil, so God thinks you're evil, and God's going to destroy you. And Jonah's being confronted with the gap between how he thought about the world and how God did. What is Jonah doing when he's described as happy? He's hoping God destroys people. Good grief. Which leads me to what we do about this. That is my best effort explaining what happened. Um, let's talk for a few minutes about what's happening in us right now because of what happened. Next slide. Let's say it this way. God says you care about a plant. I care about people. Jonah, you're happy when your plant lives and you're angry when it dies. I'm happy when people live and I'm angry when people die. Jonah, how you feel about your plant is how I feel about people. Essentially, God confronts Jonah, and I think the confrontation still stands. If you cared 10% as much about people as, as you do about your plants, um, the world would be a better place. I had an atheist ask me not too long ago. He asked me if I was a Christian. And I said, I don't know. I don't know. He said, what do you mean you don't know? It's a yes or no question. I said, no. It's not because I don't know what you think a Christian is. And if I don't know what you think a Christian is, I can't answer the question. So why don't you tell me what a Christian is, and I'll tell you if I'm that. And he was a Christian. He deconverted. And I got to tell you, if I was him, I would have too. Whoever presented the gospel to him should do God a favor and never do it again. <laughs> and he made this great point. He said if the whole world thought about God that way, the world would not be a better place. And he was right. Here's the thing, if the whole world converted to how we're thinking about God and one, how we're thinking about the world and how we're applying scripture, would the world be a better place? And if the answer is no, we gotta deal with that. And one of the things we gotta deal with is do we care about plants more than people? I, 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 here's the problem with plants, okay? The problem with plants is there's nothing wrong with them. God gave him his plant, there, there's, it's nothing inherently sinful. The problem with plants is they're, they're temporary. They're, they're, they're not permanent. And I love, it. Here's, here's gracious living. Gracious living is being willing to enjoy our plants without feeling guilty unless they take precedence over people, right? That's, the, that's graciousness, right? Like, and, and Australia is full of plants. I love it. A plant in this story, by the way, is a metaphor for things that give us temporary pleasure. And Australia is full of that. And I love our plants. My goodness, I love Australia. A nation with motor cars, paved road stores that prepackage food for us, clean water in our taps, machines that do washing, other machines that do drying, world-class health care right down the road is largely free or at least affordable. No one here is scared of going bankrupt if you get sick. Why? Because this is Australia, right? This is a great place. Americans don't have that. My uncle died of COVID. He was in ICU for six weeks. His medical bill was $1.1 million. He's my mom's brother, okay? Like, yeah, yeah, so when Australians go, I'll take the risk. What risk? Other than dying, somebody else is paying the hospital. But see, see, the, the issue is we have so many plants in Australia. It's just a great place. And I want to be clear about this. I love, I think free health care is really good. I, I think, I, I love the plants. And my understanding is if you drive to Nimbin. <laughs> there's like plants, right? But there's so many good plants. I tell you, like, like, like we're in a climate-controlled facility. Boy, if you ever traveled overseas, this is a good plant. Hey, I tell you what's a good plant. This is amazing. On my phone, I have an app. If you've never heard of this, it's awesome. It's called Ko, right? 
K-A-Y-O. If you haven't heard of this, go check this out. So K-O um, allows me to watch live U.S. sport in full HD on my phone. <laughs> Here's the thing, right? I love K-O. But it's a plant. I'll tell you why. It requires a data signal. I've, I've always given the rural communities my time in Australia because I think the heart of Australia is, and I, I go out to places lots of, like, and I don't charge them. I just go bless them. And um, um, and so one of the places I go, I have been going for years, is a place called Gainda, right? Hey, hey, you, ever, you know where Gainda is? It's awesome. Hey, you drive to hell, turn left, Gainda. Right? <laughs> right. It's so. That's no, true. Like you're in hell, and then you turn left, and in the middle of hell, oh, this is okay, right? And. And so I was in Gainda one night, and then the next night I was in Mergen, and then the next night King Arroy, and then the next night Chinchilla, and then I came, right? So this is so now now the road from Gainda to Mergen is called the A3. And and it's the, theoretically the main road. Now, here's the thing, right? There's a major game on. And I thought, <laughs> I can make this two-hour drive go really well. I'll Bluetooth KO to my car, and I can listen to the game, and it'll make the... T- here's the problem, right? How much of that road do you think has a data signal? <laughs> not, not one K of it. I don't know how many dead bodies are out there. What would you do? You can't call. There's no phone signal, no nothing. I got three minutes out of Gainda, and my game sounded like this. <laughs> one minute later, gone. And I was very angry about my plant. <laughs> it upset me greatly. Here's, here's another plant, broadband Wi-Fi. Like most everybody in, in this room would have broadband Wi-Fi. And, and if, you, if you don't, you should try it. And here's the thing, right? Like it's an amazing thing. And, but when it goes out, you realize how much of your life sort of is connected to it, right? Like, like, like you're, at the base level, your entertainment, like Netflix, right? I mean, I've heard people complain about Netflix. How do you complain about Netflix? It's like, what's wrong with you? Well, there's bad stuff on Netflix. Yeah, don't click on it, right? Like, in the Assyrian, yeah, okay, fine. In the Assyrian Empire, Friday night entertainment was skinning people. <laughs> Netflix is better. All right, so, so, so our entertainment, our work, everything's, t- you, you think about what happens when your Wi-Fi goes out. Oh. And what do you do? Well, you do the only thing you know to do. You can you unplug the router and wait 10 seconds. <laughs> and hopefully it works. If it doesn't work, what do you got to do? You got to call Telstra. Oh, no! <laughs> Flipping Telstra is two hours of my life. <laughs> we get very angry about our plants. And here's the thing. We should be able to enjoy our plants without feeling guilty. But it should mark us that we're 100% more angry about our plants than injustice, than the vulnerable being taken advantage of, the vulnerable being putting in a more vulnerable spot, the poor not being lifted. How? How? Now, great sermons are not meant to be agreed with, nor disagreed with. Like if you say, I love this, I so agree with you. So? Or if you say, I hate this, I disagree with you. Also, so? The sermons aren't meant to be agreed with or disagreed with. They're meant to make us think and wrestle for application. The best way to do that is with questions. Next slide. Let's, let's ask ourselves a few questions. How do we think about our enemies? Like, really? Not, not, as a, not as a throwaway line, but Jesus saw the world being better if we could actually find our way clear to bless our enemies. Can you bless them? The Democrats. The Labor Party. You know, as if God is up in heaven worried about, like, are you serious? I handled the primordial chaos. I've handled the Egyptian empire, the Babylonian empire, the Assyrian empire, the Roman empire, the dark ages. I think, I, I think he can handle Donald Trump, right? It's like, oh, no, what am I going to do? No, come on. Jesus saw the world as better if we could see our enemies as people to bless, not to hurt. Are we still us and them thinkers? Are we acting for a temporary pursuit or for permanent progress? Certain things are obviously temporary. Pandemics don't last forever. But how we think about the other does. And so are we living for our temporary things or for permanent people? I, I'd say one question we need to address is, is there any place we've forgotten our fish? In this story, Jonah gets rescued from drowning by a fish, and then he still thinks it's okay to be mean to people he deems as evil. 
It's so weird. That, and that's what happens. He wants mercy for himself and justice for everybody else. And that's what happens when we forget our mercy stories. I think it's very important for us to take a second and remember, hey, wait a minute. There was this time I non-consented to wisdom and love, and I got the consequences of it only to find that God was nice to me too. And if God was nice to me, he'd be nice to them. Let, let's say this way. Next slide. Do we believe or do we actually care? That's two different things. I believe in Jesus. So Jesus isn't somebody to believe in. Demons believe in Jesus. That doesn't, like, Jesus is not someone to believe in. Jesus is someone to fundamentally shape the way we see our whole world. Yeah. Fundamentally shape the way we see God and fundamentally shape the way we apply scripture. Um, do I believe, but mm, do I actually care? But no one's going to remember the whole sermon. So I've dumbed both of these sermons down into one question. Um, and the, the question I want us to remember and wrestle with is plant or people. For us to be a great church, we have to deal with that first. Are we going to live for our plants or are we going to live for people? Are we going to use our freedom to make lives better, particularly the most vulnerable and the poor? Or are we going to live for our temporary pleasures? And what God says to Jonah and what Jesus reminds his followers of is plants are good, but they're temporary. And may they never take precedent over people. So my brothers and sisters... May we be part of recapturing the beauty of the word Christian by seeing the world how Jesus saw it, seeing God how Jesus saw it, and applying scripture how Jesus saw it. May our behaviors and our freedoms and our resources be used to lift the lowly to the level of the elite, to make the vulnerable less vulnerable, and to, and to appeal to those of weaker conscience, because that's how Jesus saw the world. May we be those people by addressing this one simple question, am I going to live for plants or am I going to live for people? Lord, give us the courage to see things different, the irresistible urge to respond to what we see. May we be a church of people, focused people, instead of plant-focused people. Give us the courage to uplift people instead of living for our plants. Amen. Would you look this way? Thanks so much for letting me be a part of your morning. Hope Jesus got bigger, the cross worked better, the resurrection is central, scriptures got bigger, not smaller. Um, if you're able to stay in, you need to check with the powers that be that there's a seat. Um, uh, I do have a totally different message in the second one that will be part two of this. Um, and so about what kind of church we're trying to become, a well-based place or a fence-based place. We're going to talk about that in the next service. Okay, grace and peace, everybody.